I'm here today with Jim Barron, Director of Marketing Operations at Exactly, to talk all things marketing operations and overall revenue operations. Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure, Eddie. Thanks for having me. So if you could describe a little bit more about your role at Exactly in marketing operations and your team and what that looks like today. Yeah, so I've been with Exactly for about two and a half years, and um, I lead a marketing operations and web operations group. So I have three individuals dedicated to running traditional marketing operations uh, projects and, and functions, and I have two individuals focused on the UX of the website and how that's overall performing. That's awesome. So tell me about, I guess, I think one question I'd like to ask to start this off with is, how did you guys determine the people that you needed on your team? And why is it necessary to have so many people on the marketing operations team as opposed to doing actual marketing or by extension, actual sales and service on the overall revenue operations team? So let me ask this simpler. If you're a smaller organization and you're thinking about building out a revenue operations function, how do you start to think about the individuals that you need doing that as opposed to the front end work of marketing sales or service? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think of operations kind of like the, the oil for the engine. Um, so you, you know it's there, you, you expect it to, you expect things to run smoothly. And so when you have a, a strong operations function, whether it's sales operations, marketing operations, working together as a rev ops org, you'll have a, an easier time measuring and tracking the performance of things end to end. So if you're looking at how a program that you're planning is uh, going to perform, the, you know, from taking that from big idea and breaking it down into the tactical uh, elements of that is where operations can come in and make sure that all those elements run smoothly and everything is tracked appropriately. And so um, when I think of traditional marketing operations, it is lead management, database management, lead routing, lead scoring, uh, campaign performance, pipeline forecasting, all of those elements that you need to work with sales operations um, in order to make sure that the handoff from the marketing team to the sales team is as seamless as possible and, and everything's tracked. So you've been in this role in a number of different organizations. I would really love to hear how you think about, how do you know when you have enough people? And if we think about smaller organizations, when do you need to start with someone in revenue operations? What's the appropriate time to start? Yeah, so it's funny because I look at smaller organizations and usually they grow like crazy and then try to scale that growth. And that's where operations takes a bigger priority. And so um, I've heard other CMOs on LinkedIn kind of write their posts about um, how if they were starting over, they would start with operations um, and hiring operations folks. I like that approach. I have a bias towards it. I love that they that they want to do that. But um, I think that starting out when being able to execute uh, a lot of programs all at once um, isn't isn't where an operations function really sits. And so I operations I, I would consider the next in line right after the planning of campaigns and building out of a sales organization because you do need to make sure that, that some things are running appropriately, but usually you can start out with one person that has kind of an operations mentality. And what I mean by that is an operations mentality is going into the systems and seeing that things are either working, you know, finding, finding areas where things are not working appropriately or, or you're coming up with obstacles or, or block points that are creating frustration within either the marketing or the sales org. And so if you can, uh, have an individual that is dedicated to trying to remove those obstacles and make sure things run more smoothly, you are now starting to build out an operations organization. So as you start to grow your sales team and your marketing team, you need to add more individuals to that team to run the reporting and analytics, maintain the database, maintain the, the actual system, the technology that sits behind that and make sure it continues to operate and, and function appropriately because um, at that time you're you're, you may find that you're growing without um, and, and not actually solving any of the problems. Yeah, I, I think that we see that a lot. And when I think back about the experience I've had working with our customers or even being internal in sales, you know, to use an extreme example, you know, I've been like the first sales guy in, in a number of startups. And then by extension, I wouldn't call myself the first marketing guy, but with no one in marketing, guess who, you know, that fell, like whose plate that fell on, right? So literally having yeah. meetings with an advertising agency when I'm like the one and only account executive at a company, like doesn't make any sense, but. Um, no, and, but not uncommon. 
No, it's not. And what like what you commonly fall into is this situation where now all of a sudden not only are you doing sales uh, and potentially marketing, but you're also doing sales ops and marketing ops. You are the person that is going to set up Salesforce. You are the person that's going to go out and find you know, the leads or the contacts that you're going to call uh, or go to your boss and say, we need to buy this list and then figure out how to get them into your CRM and then figure out how to build out your, you know, your sales cadence for your outbound if that's what you're doing. Um, and now all of a sudden you have all of this time to sell that's being consumed by other activities that could be done in a fraction of the time by somebody that is better at that activity than you and probably cheaper, especially if we look at this from an opportunity cost. I mean, simple math, if you have a million dollar quota and you work 40 hours a week, that's a quota of $500 an hour, effectively. So if you spend 10 hours on you know, building out Salesforce, that costs you $5,000 assuming that you're somebody that is able to hit quota. And how much does it cost to have, you know, a revenue operations professional or an outsourced consultant build out, you know, Salesforce if it's one user, it's comparatively not going to be $5,000 per account executive, right? Um, but as you but you're not going to hire a full-time RevOps person, you know, if you have a one one salesperson organization, typically, unless you have really big growth plans. But when do you think it makes sense to start to bring those folks in? You're talking about effectively what I'm hearing is that you've got a sales leader in place, you've got a marketing leader in place, you have a strategy mapped out, and you're saying this is how we're going to market. Now maybe you've hired some in, you know front end salespeople or some front end marketers, um, but now all of a sudden you like don't have any of the systems and processes set up. So are you saying that that is where you recommend? organizations start to look at having an operations professional? Uh, yes, and it's usually like, I wouldn't say there's a good ratio of like marketing, you know, total marketing team to marketing operations or sales team to sales operations. But as you start to, as you start to grow, you're gonna find individuals have already been doing this type of work and it's just actually dedicating uh, that role to, to that person or bringing in somebody from the outside like you had mentioned and having them start to do that function uh, for the entire organization. And so like, for example, on our side, we had, um, we have about 30 marketers, um, you know, worldwide, and we had three marketing operations people. And as we grew the marketing team out, there was a need for more marketing operations headcount. And honestly, like the, the 10 to one that I kind of mentioned here, I wouldn't say that that's the right ratio, but I mean, I, I think that depending on what you are tasking the team with and, and the volume of programs that you're trying to execute on, volume of things that you're trying to do, reporting that you're trying to do, that is when you can start to right size the team. And that's actually why we took on web operations on our side is we work so closely with that team from the handoff between the website to our marketing automation platform to the CRM that we needed to be more in lockstep than we had been in the past. And so marketing operations, you know, took on web operations as well to, to really make sure that handoff was, was as seamless as possible. Yeah, and I think that, that that seamless handoff and that integration between sales, service, marketing, et cetera, is increasingly getting a lot of attention in the market. And we're seeing more and more organizations that recognize the need to do this. And that's something you and I have talked about a lot as well. I'd love to get your opinion on that while we're here recording. Um, Tell me a little bit more about like maybe some of the pitfalls that you've seen from organizations that are not properly aligned and, and some of the, the wins that you've seen from organizations that are properly aligned across specifically marketing and sales. But if you want to share what you've seen with service as well, I think that'd be great too. Yeah, absolutely. I think the number one thing that one of the pitfalls that you get when you do not have alignment is a credibility issue. There's a lot more finger pointing that goes on when there is not alignment on how things are going to be measured who's getting credit for what. And I say credit because that's exactly how we're trying to, to measure these things. What are we attributing the source of an opportunity or the source of a deal um, back to? So we can say, let's go do more of those things to drive more opportunities. Now there is no linear path to creating, you know, to, to any kind of buyer's journey, but it does start somewhere. And being able to point back to that source is where I think the handshake really needs to start between marketing, sales, and finance teams. Like if, if, if your finance team is setting quotas and targets um, on the sales team and you wanna make sure that they're using the same data that the sales team and marketing team are measuring themselves against, so everybody is aligned on the data set being used and how we're gonna go measure that. And I think 
that is that is the number one thing that causes a lot of uh, tension in an organization is not having that proper alignment between marketing, sales, and finance. And um, what we did er, early on it exactly, like when I first started, very first month I was there, had all three groups in a room and go through the, the nitty gritty details of how we're going to go and measure this and everybody come to an agreement. And that has been changed a little bit over time, but it's always been those three organizations getting together, discussing what we want to change, and then making that change together. And that is something that um, if you can get right, you've now laid the foundation for having trust between all the organizations and then being able to execute on on the programs or cadences or whatever it might be without having the, the finger pointing conversation of, well, I actually did this thing before you did that thing, and that's why it should be credited over here instead of here. And that's something that you know the more organizations you can get involved um, in that in that process, uh, the the more credibility you'll build throughout the rest of the organization. That makes a lot of sense, and I think you know an example that we see so often of this is the fight over leads created versus leads closed, and there's a lot of strong opinions on whether or not marketing should be tracking towards lead generation or revenue. I'm curious what your opinion is on this and maybe some examples you've seen. It's got to be both. It's got to be both. But I think it does need to start with lead generation. So when we talk about, this is what I talk about with that, with that handshake agreement between the three organizations, marketing, sales, and finance. Like if we can say definitively and agree that leads sourced from these different areas are going to be categorized in such a way then we can set goals against who's going to contribute to lead generation, whether it's marketing, setting up the meetings through advertising that comes in off of you know, the various sources through the website, however that may, may look, or whether it's sales running cadences or sales plays and sourcing their, their own meetings and opportunities from there. That is one aspect of it. But sales cycles, they vary you know, from, you know, could be a month, could be a year. All, those, all that time in the sales cycle that we are continuing to market to individuals and as sales is continuing to reach out and use marketing material or other material that they've created to go and, and get that individual to buy is also tracked and it attributed it back in some way through some multi-touch attribution. And this is where, yes, we have an agreement on source, but yes, we also have an agreement that there are there is no one thing that is taking place uh, to get to a closed one booking. And so when you actually go and measure bookings, I don't find that using one source as the pinpoint of like, this is what got us this opportunity uh, to be the most credible way of measuring something. I think you really do need to show all the various touch points that have taken place over time. And then based on your own weighting and, and how you want to figure this out in your own, own, uh, own organization, you can actually come up with a, a way to attribute percentage of spend and percentage of the value of that bookings into into different sources. That makes a lot of sense. And if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like your response to the ongoing debate over multi-channel attribution is that A, it's important to measure it, and B, it's important to take it with a grain of salt in the sense that it's very subjective. That for you to say that X percentage of this deal or this customer came from this channel, but at the end of the day, if you're not measuring that, then how do you make informed decisions around where to invest time, money, and resources in both marketing and sales if you're not looking at what's potentially contributing to that revenue, right? Absolutely. And there is no, you know, magic bullet or like totally right answer when it comes to marketing attribution and saying like, that's the way to do it. And this is the way everybody should be doing it. It is org by org and it is channel by channel. And it has to change over time as as the market changes, for example, everybody going into lockdown and because of COVID and working from home, all of a sudden events, which may have had a higher uh, attribution in the past, are no longer relevant. And so you need to change how you're going to weight virtual events or webinars or any kind of digital activity that someone may be uh, engaging with um, a little bit higher now because you don't have the events to to carry that weighting. And so that's just, it always has to be tinkered with. And it's why so many companies talk about marketing attribution as part of their, um, their technology stack. And it's like, if I have, you know, four different technologies that are all measuring attribution a little bit differently, I, I, I 
one, take that with a grain of salt, but also work with those vendors to make sure that they're applying the right set of uh, criteria that we would measure the organization on. But we still have an internal way of agreeing and saying, this is why this is the weighting that we're applying to this channel at this time because of X, Y, Z reasons. But that's all agreed on. Well, this is a perfect lead into one of the questions that I've been wanting to ask, which is, you know, about your tech stack. Um, and we don't necessarily have to talk specifically about exactly, but I would love if you could share some examples of some of the broad categories of the tech stack that you're using today or that you've used in the past. So to summarize this so we can make a short clip out of this is what's your tech stack look like today? Yeah, tech stack is, is pretty huge and it varies. And we've put together the tech map before from marketing automation platform, website, Salesforce, you know, for the CRM. And then how that even links up to our ERP and, and budget allocation platforms. And it is wild to look at, but it does tell a, a pretty good story about why each piece of technology exists in the stack and creates a point where somebody can look at a piece of technology and say, okay, I see we're spending money here. How much are we spending? Who's using it? And is this something that is possibly being duplicated um, in another technology or, or you know, it creates a very easy way to analyze your entire stack. So when I think of the stack, I think of all the technology that uh, is integrated with the website. So it's the CMS platform that we're on. It's like Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics to capture um, how, like where that, where that traffic is coming from. And then it, it, all that sits in the marketing automation platform. And within that platform, whether it's you know, Eloqua, Marketo, Pardot, the, you know, kind of just to name the big three, um, throw HubSpot on that list too. But like there is a, this is where your data cleansing goes, your segmentation is, your uh, maintenance, maintenance of the emailable lists, your lead scoring, sometimes lead assignment is done out of there. Like your marketing automation platform is one of your most powerful pieces of technology because of how integrated it can be with all the other software that's out there, which then allow you to go and create very targeted segmentation for, uh, for future marketing. And then if you can push all of that data into Salesforce or into a data warehouse, if you, have, uh, if you have one, this is where the rest of the organization gets visibility into how these, technolo how these technologies are supporting their business. And so, for example, when I think about intent gathering uh, data, uh, intent data that we're gathering through an ABM platform, um, ABM is typically thought of as a marketing tool. Well, we use it as a marketing and sales tool because the same data that we're using to create marketing segments for accounts that are showing buying signals to us, we actually allow sales to use those same reports and those same flags to go and prospect into those warmer accounts that are showing buying signals. And so you create this two-pronged approach of we're going to do digital advertising here and you know emails and, and promotions for that account here, but they're also getting a more personalized touch from the sales rep um, when it comes to uh, trying to attack that account. And so this is where marketing and sales partnership is really helpful. And I think using the entire using the tech stack across marketing and sales can be can be in just immensely helpful. What's ABM? Yeah, ABM, account based marketing. It's it's funny that you say that because like there is a flavor of ABM for everybody that wants to create one, just like marketing attribution. And so uh, some companies will think of ABM as a hyper-targeted marketing strategy for a subset of accounts. Now that subset of accounts is usually the point of differentiation between a lot of companies. Some companies target five, 10, 20 accounts in a given time period and focus those on ABM. And some do an account-based marketing strategy of targeting 100 accounts or 500 accounts. In my opinion, the more accounts you add to your account-based marketing strategy, the less account-based it becomes and more industry-based it becomes or vertical or employee size or revenue size. So I think of account-based marketing as you know, capping it around like 20, 30 accounts. There is the agreement, and this is in, again, a hugely important agreement between marketing and sales about what that account set looks like. Because if marketing is saying, this is the account set we're gonna go target for ABM, and they just tell sales that they're gonna go do that, now we have excluded a key player in that operation to help us go and create a personalized cadence for that uh, particular uh, account-based strategy. 
Um, and it also becomes, we also might miss out on the marketing side on critical information about an account that we may not have had included in our initial criteria when we were looking for uh, an account to target. And so working with sales and coming to that agreement on what that looks like, uh, what that account set looks like is the first step. And then what I find to be, what, what I find to be the miss here down the line is everybody gets on board for ABM. They're ready to go. We have an agreed account set. Program launches, and after a month, everybody has forgotten what we've what we've done, why we targeted these accounts, or you know what the result was. And so, this this goes back to the planning process of having clear goals about what account based marketing will look like, um, and then having a regular and frequent cadence of meetings to follow up on how these accounts are progressing. And so, whether you're building your reports out of you know, a data warehouse, out of Salesforce, Excel even, and reporting on just that account subset and how opportunities are being created, activities being logged uh, against that account, new people being added to the database, accounts falling out of that program. This is where that regular and frequent meeting between marketing and sales needs to take place because it you have to stay in lockstep and you have to define the period of time that you're going to go and measure this program on. Um, but that's the that's another pitfall of ABM is it usually gets like marketing says they're going to go do it, but if you don't have that initial collaboration, you're just now pushing another marketing program onto sales. That's one of the better and more detailed answers I've heard when I ask people what ABM is. And then I don't know if you use the term ABS or account based sales, but I've heard it so oftentimes used where people talk about ABM in the context of sales, and that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what they're talking about is actually sales, right? And it's interesting for me when I first ran into that term, I thought, wait, account-based marketing, account-based sales, so you're going to target a specific account with a specific message that's relevant and personalized to them. Isn't that just sales? Isn't that just what you do with your tier one prospects? Um, but partnering with marketing and having marketing you know, support that with the right marketing message that's specifically tailored for that account can be really powerful. I'd love if you could share some examples of how you do that. Yeah, so when you have an agreed account set that you're going after, you can create specific advertising for that account and display it across a multitude of channels that marketing knows best. So marketing has these channels already at their fingertips. They already spend dollars on these channels. And now if you're creating hyper-targeted ads for an account, while the sales rep is sending out personalized emails to the contacts that on that account, we're targeting the entire account, even if we have people that aren't even in the database yet. And so like marketing's reach can be so much broader um, and cast such a wider net that having that partnership between the two will really help make sure that we have blanketed that account with our logo and it's personalized to their solution and how we want to how we want them to engage with us. So that way when they do come to the website and they do give us their information, sales will have somebody to go contact because marketing has already kind of uh, been in front of that that person. And, and started that conversation kind of subconsciously for them. And so that's where I, I, I think of how marketing supports the sales approach to ABM. I sometimes call it ABX, where it's, you know, it's marketing and sales together. It's, you know, the whole organization's got to get behind this. Um, but that's, a, that's just another way I would think about how marketing and sales are working together to, to warm up an entire account and then get really targeted for the individuals on that account. What kind of channels are you typically using to, to advertise into that particular account, for example? So I don't know if Pepsi is a good example, but let's just use it because it's a name ever, we all know. If you're trying to get in front of Pepsi, how are you advertising and getting your message in front of those folks, especially if they're unidentified people? Yeah, so I'm, I love LinkedIn. I mean, that works out really well for our industry. So we use LinkedIn pretty heavily. We use the Google Display Network really heavily. Um, we do targeting on Bing as well. A lot of companies, um, large enterprises even, will not allow maybe Google Chrome as far as like their uh, 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 web browser, and they instead have uh, Microsoft Edge. So you got to make sure that you're on Bing as well and advertising there. But um, then uh, you know, just other other third-party display networks, sometimes smaller, depending on how they fit for our industry, we'll advertise with them as well. Um, I think that's where your due diligence comes in when your demand gen team and digital team are reviewing potential third parties to, to get leads from. Marketing operations is helping provide the insights around what channels have been working best. And then when they go and review other vendors or third parties to go and promote on their own networks, 
um, marketing, they, they're making an informed decision about what that audience looks like that typically, that typically visits that network. And so um, just another way of, of, again, integrating that all with your marketing automation platform. So that way you can capture that data, analyze that data, and make an informed decision to either add or remove from your tech stack um, at a later date. You're leading right into the next question that I wanted to ask, which is to talk about how you provide that data back to to sales, right? So, you know, to kind of recap some of the things that you've talked about, you have all of your data, your advertising, your social, your well, email, obviously, and it's all coming through the funnel, which is your marketing automation platform that then funnels into your Salesforce or your CRM, whatever you're using, right? So now all of a sudden you have all of this data, but share a little bit more detail. If I'm one of your sales reps and I'm trying to go after Pepsi, what kind of data are you providing me about the success of your account-based marketing plan? And what do I do with that? Yeah, so I love this question because there's a a really... uh, you mentioned the funnel. There's a funnel, there's a kind of a funnel style way of looking at this. And so, for example, when I think about all the data that's collected across social networks, uh, just uh, Google and, uh, and Bing, what our marketing automation platform connects from our own website and, and people being cookied or able to be cookied, you know, have, that they have accepted that. Um, all of that is the, the high level data that we collect at the account. So if you have a good account based marketing platform in place, you're even reaching further than that and seeing the keywords that that account is looking at on the web or topics that they may be searching um, through, other, through other channels that your account-based marketing platform is picking up, associating it back to the IP of that company, and then creating that touch point on the, on the buyer's journey uh, for that account rep. So you can see basically all the anonymous activity that's taking place across an account um, before an individual is even even knows who you are and and what they're really searching for. So what I like to show is basically um, kind of a staged funnel approach where it's uh, individuals looking for keywords but not actually hitting our website are in that stage of we know we have a problem and we know that there's a solution out there. We just don't know who to go talk to about this solution. Then when you start to have people hit your website or looking for your your brand. Um, as it, as, it, you know, as it appears on Google or, or Bing, now you're seeing individuals that know the players in the game and are interested in possibly learning more. So this is where if you have a good review site as well, you know, the, the trust radiuses of the world, the G2s, um, even Gartner and Forrester on the, on the larger enterprise side, now you have a place where you can say, okay, person is identif- the company has identified they have a problem, they know who to go talk to, and now they're going to go come and visit your website. And this is where having good, engaging content that is easy to consume and easy to, to access, whether it's ungated or very low gates, where it's just give us your email and you know you can take this piece of content with you and, and review. This is where now you're flagging that information to a sales rep and saying, go talk to this person at the account. So instead of targeting the account in general, which marketing has set up, now you're saying, sales rep, go talk to this individual and see if they are interested now because, because of the content that they've engaged with, keywords that they've now searched, and, and you can tie back to them. And for the individuals that are not yet part of our database, go find them on LinkedIn or, or use one of your other prospecting softwares out there to go add more people to the database and help fill out that account. So this is that, it's, a, it's again, a two-pronged approach of how marketing is setting up sales for success by flagging a, a warmer account in the system and slowly working that account into a known individual that we can go talk to. And they are already pretty far down the funnel at that point because they, they're already hitting our website. They're, ready, they're already talking to us and want, to be, and want to be contacted. So a lot of that decision's made. So it's up to the sales rep now to, to go and, and kick off that conversation and provide that face to, to our brand. So we've, do- we've do- dove in, dove? really deep into ABM, but I think this has been incredibly interesting. So we go back to our example of Pepsi, and you're putting out all this advertising on Bing, on uh, on LinkedIn, on all these other channels. You're getting your message in front of folks at Pepsi, hopefully decision makers at Pepsi. Meanwhile, the sales team is out reaching out to people and trying to set up meetings, and now you're 
funneling information back to them. So for unidentified visitors, people that engage this content that you haven't identified, you're starting to pick up keywords and trends and things that might resonate with this audience that salespeople can then use to tailor their messaging to what might resonate with the people that they're targeting. Meanwhile, as people come and they start to go through gates, meaning they're filling out a form on the website, providing a little bit of information such as their name, title, and or email address, now all of a sudden you match that against their cookie, and now you have this full history of information, which is sort of the basics of a marketing automation platform. And now sales is able to go in there and they're able to see not only that this person just hit the website and downloaded this white paper or watched this video, but here's all of the things they've been doing for the last three months, six months, six years, because we had a cookie on their computer and we had identified their IP address and now we're matching that against the information they provided in that form. Yeah, it's, in, it's incredible the amount of information you can gather on individuals. Um, and I will say the recent laws that, that have been passed, bills that have been enacted, will make it more difficult to capture that information, but all at the, uh, uh, protection of consumer data and consumer and consumer rights, and so um, marketing will get a little more challenging for uh, to target that information and use that information. But um, marketing has adapted before, and it will adapt again and find other ways to go and and flag that information for reps. Well, this is something that I find to be a really interesting topic, and that I'm pretty passionate about talking about. In that, at the end of the day, I think to some extent, right, all sales, all marketing, all customer service is trying to do a few things. One, it's trying to better serve the customer, and that's ultimately what it needs to do. But it's also trying to serve the organization, and you oftentimes have these two things battling each other, right? And I think I complain about this a lot on the customer service side, where I feel like every new innovation, every new piece of tech just degrades the customer experience so that the organization can spend less money serving me as a customer. And it seems like as a society, we all just accept that because we want cheaper and faster goods. And if the experience, customer experience detracts, sometimes, especially on the consumer side, we, we accept that. Less so on the B2B and enterprise side. But I think that if you're in sales or marketing or service or you're a revenue leader or revenue operations leader, you really need to think about as things continue to evolve, how is our customer experience going to evolve? Whatever piece of technology or new process we're implementing or new person we're hiring, whatever initiative we're rolling out, how's this going to affect our customer experience? And is that going to put us in a positive light with that customer or not? And I think back about you know, the evolution that we've had over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And you look at it and you see, okay, like all the things you just shared with ABM, all of the social media, the advertising, cookies on people's computers, gated content. What is content to begin with? I mean, a lot of that stemmed from SEO, which stemmed from search engines, which stemmed from the innovation of the, or the invention of, or the prolifer prol ah, proliferation of the internet. Because all, before that, all we were doing was like thumbing through the yellow pages to try to find our preferred vendor for something, right? So as soon as we have a new piece of technology, such as a search engine, marketing has a new onus to come up with ways to grab that attention. And I think that we have gone through this evolutionary process where the customer experience is better. If I want to learn about a given topic, I now have white papers and YouTube and webinars and live and, and uh, virtual events and all of these ways to learn about things without being dependent upon a sales rep to explain it to me. Um, and I also still have the sales rep to help me out. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I think that we're evolving in the right direction, but I oftentimes see that we diverge in different, different paths that sometimes don't always take us to our final destination of having a better customer experience. Yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, I've heard uh, anecdotally from sales reps and marketing that we are doing too much and that there's too much content and there's too, too many things that we're doing to possibly um, create a good customer experience. The reality is everybody learns and consumes information differently. And so you want to make sure you show up across as many channels as you can and try and engage the customer as, in as many different ways as you can. Uh, to, to, that fits their learning style. Now, that being said, this is why we brought web operations under marketing operations because that, that first impression that you're making is usually the website. Um, sometimes it's a display ad somewhere or um, it could be an email. I think communication limits, by the way, for email are incredibly important, um, especially when you're 
talking about creating a sales cadence and creating marketing emails. You don't want crosstalk between the two. You don't want to be marketing uh, somebody with an email and then having sales send someone uh, either that same email or another email. Like that's, that's a poor customer experience. And that's where coordination between the two groups needs to get really tight. So that way you're not creating this, this user experience that um, creates a uh, kind of like a flood of your brand against somebody when they are not even in a buying stage, for example. So like this is one of those things that you might lose a customer before you even had a chance to gain someone. And so I think of the customer experience and, and you know, being that first impression that you're making, whether it's, you know, through, you know, various channels that you're using, you know, email through the marketing automation platform or through advertising, or even through the sales, the sales reps that are reaching out. And I mean, even this goes into crafting a really good cadence. Like it, does it have too many steps into it? Um, does it have the right no, like the right um, value added to these steps? Is it like a long winded kind of email that you're trying to get in front of people that are super busy and they're not going to go and actually read through something a little bit shorter might be better. Like there's little, there's little ways that we can improve every aspect of how we're trying to talk to the customer to improve the overall experience and how they think about our brand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to be sensitive to your time here, but if you have it, I'd love to ask one last question before we wrap. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So you've been in marketing operations at a number of different organizations. And what I am really curious about is a general rule. When you walk in on day one, especially as uh, a leader, and you see, actually, let me recap this more concisely. If you're joining a new company and as a marketing operations or revenue operations professional, what are some of the first things that you do to assess the environment and figure out where you need to you know, fix things first? Yeah, uh, I love this question because uh, I actually just recently went through uh, an example like this. So first thing I'd like to do is a personnel assessment and understand who is currently in place for the marketing operations org, for the revenue operations org, and what has the interaction between marketing and sales been like. And so when I can take that assessment, I can get a good idea of how the team has prioritized operations and then what the skill level is of those individuals, both technically, communications wise, presentation, like how they are currently interacting with the organization. The next thing I'd like to do is take a look at what the core systems are currently set up to do. And when I say core systems, I'm thinking CRM and marketing automation. So if these systems are, I want to take an, basically I want to take an inventory of like what fields are being used, what objects are being used, what are the flows and setups of these, of these two systems that we're using as our core database and saying, this is how we're going to go and target individuals. Because if there is some inefficiencies there, then we are creating inefficiencies in the customer experience that we're trying to to create. And so Getting an assessment of those is is next on my list. And then I like to take a look at um, everything that touches those systems. So whether it's the technology that sits behind them or how we've segmented out people in the past, how we go about marketing to people, how we go about scoring people and routing leads, all of those aspects that are run across those systems um, is is my third step in that. And I think you know, looking at personnel and the core systems and then all the aspects of, of marketing operations and even sales operations for the, for the rev side uh, can help you establish where you need to prioritize your time in that first 30, 60, 90 days, and then how you can build out a better project plan to improve um, the skills of the personnel that you have in place or add to the, the personnel that you need in order to execute on the things that they're, that they're being asked to do. Um, we mentioned at the beginning of this that uh, operations is sometimes like a, a, an ad hoc task that gets assigned to people that are not actually operations people. And that is actually a, uh, it's important to note because if you have individuals in an operations role or other individuals doing operations that are not in an operations role, that will only add to the complexity that you're trying to then simplify and make sure that this machine is running as smoothly and efficiently as possible. And so personnel, core systems, and then the aspects of, of operations that I like to review and how that all touches those. Now, what, how would that change? What would you do if you were coming in as the first revenue operations hire in a much smaller organization? 
So I would definitely focus on the sales process first. Um, I think sales operations is an, an immensely critical role because you are making sure that what the sales reps are doing within your system is being recorded appropriately and that they are able to create quotes and send out contracts and receive signatures and are incentivized properly um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, from there, all the other aspects of operations becomes a lot simpler. So that you can start to uh, identify, after, after that sales process is kind of set, you can start to identify other areas uh, to gain efficiencies on the marketing side, customer success, other individuals using, using that database and leveraging that database for their source of, of information. Um, I think that's a, if you're the first person coming into a RevOps org, that's where you start because you want to make sure that you are taking in revenue and, and recording bookings appropriately and uh, being able to allow the customer to interact with you and the sales rep as quickly as possible and as seamlessly as possible. I think that makes a lot of sense and we see a lot of that in our work as well. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me today and, and sharing all these insights. I think it's been really valuable. Absolutely, Eddie. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.